And now we're thrilled to welcome Damaris B. Hill to the show. Damaris is the author of A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, The Incarceration of African-American Women from Harriet Tubman to Sandra Bland, a 2020 NAACP Image Award nominee for Outstanding Literary Work in Poetry, The Fluid Boundaries of Suffrage and Jim Crow, Staking Claims in the American Heartland, and Visible Textures, Hill's Poetry Collection, uh, oh, and Visible Textures. Hill's Poetry Collection, Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood, is available for pre-order and is scheduled for release in January 2022. She is an Associate Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Kentucky. Welcome back to Maris. Thank you for the invitation, Whitney and Vivi. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be back. It's always a great time talking to you guys. Yeah, it's a thrill to have you back with us again. Um, you were born in Charleston, West Virginia, and you got your PhD at the University of Kansas in Lawrence, just up the road. And you're a professor at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Those are all towns with a real connection to the countryside. Yeah. You also grew up outside of New York in a much more populated area. So having lived in such a diversity of places, how do you think about your connection to the countryside as a writer or as a citizen? Um, it has been much of a transition. So um, even though I was born in Charleston, West Virginia, I spent a lot of my time oceanside at, in the near or on the Atlantic. Um, before moving to Kansas, I never lived, since moving to the East Coast, I never lived more than about five miles from the Atlantic Ocean. So to say that is to say that it was a transition. But since living in Kentucky, I have really learn to embrace and love the mountain geography as being just as welcoming as the ocean. Um, I recognize the diversity of waves in the diversity of the trees, right? <laughs> and I've been joking with my friends, like calling myself the, the sea dragon that, that climbs mountains because that's how I see myself inhabiting this the space now, right? Like an oceanic oriented person now embracing the landscape, geography, and cultures of um, a more interior space, right? A more country space. I mean, I don't think, I think this land along coastlines can be rural. It depends on where you are, you know, particularly in the Carolinas. In the Carolinas and um, most people don't know that like the Eastern shore of Maryland is very rural. In some places along the beach, they even have horses. Like it's that rural where wild horses exist along the Atlantic ocean. So um, I have experience with rural spaces like, you know, my family being from North Carolina, um, Maryland can be a rural space. And even um, when I was living outside of New York, in Connecticut, even though Connecticut is considered like New York metropolitan area, it's maybe 15 minutes from some very rural spaces, right? So um, this, I think oh, same, go ahead. I'm sorry, I think the same with New Jersey. Pennsylvania, Northern Pennsylvania can be very rural too. For so. sure. Um, in this episode, we're trying to imagine what rural fiction and poetry might look like in 2050. And to do that, we're gonna have to establish what rural fiction and poetry look like today. Right. So when I say that phrase, rural fiction and poetry, which is an odd sounding phrase, I mean, we're including, you know, it, it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, but um, when I say that to you, what do you picture? You know, what writers come into your head? Um, I'm going to mess up people's names. I imagine Amy. I imagine Gerard. I imagine Frank X. Walker, uh, Crystal Wilkinson. I imagine some people coming out of Northern New York, you know, um, I imagine of course people in Mississippi, in Missouri and Kansas like Wit, and um, the Latino Writers Collective, which is like in Kansas City, right? I think about Colorado, I think about Oklahoma um, and all of these writers that somehow um, a lot of the writers that are writing in the rural spaces are usually classified as Southern writers or Western writers or some larger um, geographic notion that fits in with the regionalism that may or may not 
express the diversity of the actual land space. And so um, as we were talking about before, like you can drive in half an hour outside of LA and find yourself in a rural space. I mean, Palm Springs, if it wasn't for our recollections of Coachella and, uh, and, and fancy, fancy queer parties might be a very rustic and rural space. You know, um, I'm so glad you. Yeah, you are talking about the way that we imagine the South as rural and the North and other regions of the country as though they're entirely urban. And it's so um, revealing to talk about I don't know hidden urban and hidden rural spaces. I'm especially happy to hear you talk about Maryland, where I grew up. Um, although I did Michigan's got a lot of empty space up there. <laughs> That's also true. Not a lot going on. Um, but the Eastern Shore of Maryland and sort of like. Yeah, that, I think that for, um, yeah, for Marylanders, um, mm -hmm. I think sort of we know about, we know about the Eastern Shore, but you don't necessarily hear folks outside um, talk about those, talk about those parts of the state. And of course, rural spaces have always been diverse. And for a long time, the popular conception of rural life mirrored that. And you know, Richard Wright wrote about his youth in Mississippi and Arkansas and Tennessee and Black Boy and Langston Hughes grew up in Joplin, Missouri and Lawrence, Kansas. And frequently wrote about the Midwest and Alice Walker wrote about growing up in rural Georgia. And yet, and yet, if you listen to someone talk about rural voters, heavy air quotes, rural voters in the 2016 or 2020 or 2022 election, you would think that every single person who lived outside of the city limits was white. So how did this change? I am unsure how it changed, but I wanna begin by saying, in my opinion, which is based on history. America has never been a white nation. It's always the propaganda of white, right? It's never white. So um, I think if we did not as a country have the insistent performance of white identity that our country would probably look a lot like how Montreal looks, right? <laughs> like, and some of the global features that, that are part of our country's uh, city life and interior, right? Because the most affordable places to live in the US happen to be spaces that may be rural or interior. Um, a closer examination would show that there's a wide array of different people, cultures, and um, ethnicities in these places that are um, marketed as white, right? Or told to be all white. Um, I have yet to know where those places are. I think some people claim white like on the census, but the, I wanna say three things. One, <laughs> the most rustic place I've ever been to in my life was upstate New York. And I had to leave because it was so rustic and rural that I, I couldn't take it. I had to leave um, early and it was a residency, I'm so sorry. Um, but two, one of the most diverse places that you can be is a place like Kansas, where there are many populations of Latino and indigenous people and African-American people and people from different global cultures that have been there for generations. But the third thing that I wanna say is that it is impossible for you to be in the United States for more than two generations and, and not be a little biologically diverse. So even most of the people that identify as white in the South have at least a 20% African ancestry. And if I were to do an ancestry test, I would probably have a lot more European ancestry than is documented in the census that relies on my interpretation of what my ethnicity is. I mean, isn't it possible that 
you talked about the propaganda of whiteness, that, that the need to talk about rural places as white, it has become more important recently because it's a reaction against the fact that you're talking about, which is that these categories are breaking down and that the, the country is becoming more diverse. And the 2020 census showed that almost every county in America is becoming more diverse, whether it's like more white people moving into black neighborhoods in some urban areas or, or you know, rural areas that are becoming more diverse. I mean, that that's what's happening. And I feel like maybe some of that like insistence that the rural areas are only white is coming from people who are trying to resist the fact of change. I definitely believe that people are trying to resist change and the and the and the benefits that existed prior to the shifts, right? Or the benefits that they think may exist if a space is considered white. I definitely see that being a a, a part of it. I I don't. This is so inappropriate and we might have to edit it out, but I don't know when that delusion is going to go away. <laughs> that definitely is not an yeah, no. inappropriate thing to say on this podcast. It's been like, said one way, more than one way. Um, I, I thought of one other thing that I wanted to try out on you guys and see what you thought about this was like, so I do think that the period of great migration, you know, to cities was the way that made people think about rural space as being more white and, and maybe, maybe black writers as being urban you know, quote unquote, I'm, I'm using that as a, as, as a conventional term that I don't actually agree with. Um, but if you look now in the South, you know, the South, like Georgia, for instance, that, you know, the voters of color in Georgia, there's a ton of people living there, right? That, you know, that that's also becoming Alabama. an extremely diverse state. Yeah. And also Alabama, I recently visited Alabama and I was taking a, I didn't know that the rural population of Alabama reflected such diversity, right? Asian diversity, African, Pan-African diversity, um, whitish diversity, right? Because, you know, when we start getting around the Gulf, all of that is questionable, you know? Um, uh, what's the difference between Cajun and Creole? Somebody explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> is it just... <laughs> Is a terminology, but like we talk about that that type of um, ethnic diversity being a part of of New Orleans culture, but it's a part of Gulf culture. It's a part of American culture. Russell Banks, who's been on the show, had an essay a long time ago called "The Creole." I think I don't have the title exactly right, but it's "The Creolization of America," and he's saying that's one of our, that's what America is. You know <laughs> that 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 tradition. Is, is, I, is more central to us. Than I did an experiment about that a, a, a while ago when I was working at Southern Illinois University um, in Edwardsville. And I made a commitment for a whole semester to call all of um, the characters in the books that I was teaching American Creoles that reflected ethnic whiteness or American Creoles that reflected ethnic blackness just because I wanted to have a deeper conversation about um, American culture and about American literature that wasn't binary. I, may I do love that. that, that's so cool. I'm gonna try that. Yeah, you should see people's faces for like the first two weeks, like they, they're adjusting to that, right? Because the possibility that, that whiteness is not absolute or pure disrupts some people, not all people, or blackness too, if for that matter, disrupt some people, but then we get used to it, right? How did that change the conversation? Like over the course of the term, what unexpected things happened as a result of you trying that? That's so interesting. Well, I tried that experiment because we were, we were reading some Morrison. I believe we were reading, um, some Gail Jones and some Octavia Butler. And I wanted to complicate the issues of ethnicity as much as these ideas of power were complicated. And um, that, that helped me because we can't talk about like, for example, we can't like, okay. Perigadora, 
I'm gonna talk about Gail Jones because I'm in Kentucky. Caricadora is a, a story of um, power and a history of enslavement and four generations of women that, that have to somehow find a way to regain themselves back after being owned for four generations. But it's also a, a story about immigration. These four black women are, are, are from Brazil. They are black women and they are from Brazil and they are coming to the States to a space like Kentucky, seeking a new life, right? And living with the legacies of bondage and slavery in their lives and how to, um, how to exist outside of that legacy. So that's just one example about how these notions of what being American is, if the default assumption of American is that it's somebody of white ethnic heritage who hasn't immigrated to the States within the past two generations, it really disrupts that. So as you're sort of talking about here, right, America has never been white. Um, there are and always have been writers of color who write about rural life. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned your colleague at the University of Kentucky, for instance, Frank X. Walker, who coined the term Afrolatia mm -hmm. to describe Black life in the Appalachians, although the fact that he needed to do that, I think, tells us something. So I'm curious to hear you talk um, a little bit more about the writers you follow who are writing about the diversity of life in rural spaces today. Can, can I talk about Afrolation and his need to do that? Please, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And I think I'll more and more, oh, I'm gonna be in trouble. More and more, the publishing industry assists, right? Because it is a part of these business machines that perpetuate um, hard, fast identities that um, that are necessary to sell products, but justice would be if we didn't have to have a term like Afrolatia. That would be justice, right? So if we could control or reverse or recondition and re-educate the effects of racism on this country, terms like Afrolatia would not even be necessary. Right? I've been thinking a lot about that. But I'm sorry, you wanted to go back to the question you were asking. Well, you kind of already, I feel like we actually, you actually did a good job of answering this before. So maybe you don't have to answer it again. You mentioned Crystal uh, is it Wilkerson. I had her on a yeah. list of, yeah. Um, and, and other writers today who are writing, who are writers of color who are writing about rural uh, spaces. Yeah, I mean, even when Nikki Finney writes about South Carolina, she's writing about rural spaces. In Breath Better Spent, I, I, and the introduction, I spend a little bit of time talking about um, uh, the plantation where some of my ancestors were enslaved, which is in a very rural part of North Carolina along the coast, about an hour in from Kitty Hawk, and we know Kitty Hawk is like an island, so maybe 15 to 30 minutes from the beach definitely in the swamps. And um, thinking also about rural spaces and swamps and uncultivated spaces, not only were they spaces um, that um, were already diverse, but they were also, the diversity was also inspired by the need for people to seek refuge against the threats of white supremacy. So in rural North Carolina and South Carolina, many people that were brought to the country to be enslaved that decided not to be enslaved formed communities in the swamps with alligators and snakes, right? Many of the people who may have escaped slavery in Missouri may have sought refuge in rural spaces at the threats of coyotes, bobcats, wolves, and decided to protect themselves against those dangers rather well, than. There's other. that historically black town in Kansas called Nicodemus. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's uh, kind of amazing. Yeah. I'm sorry, what were you gonna ask? But very familiar with the space. 
I was just, that was all I was saying. Like that, that, that town, you know, I, th I thought of the other thing I think that people don't often recognize is that, you know, there's a history of black farming there, you know, you, you know, not every farmer in America is white. You know, there's lots of different kinds of people who farm. Now there have been impediments to that. And actually the New York times has been writing some interesting stories about how, uh, black farmers were, you know, lost land over different times due to structural Absolutely. racism. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist, you know? I mean, I had a character who was a black farmer in my very first novel. And, and I think that's an important part of America's agricultural heritage that often gets overlooked. That's a very important part of, uh, Af of, of American cultural heritage. I mean, um, African people and, 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 and some, some Indian and Asian people were, were brought to the United States to be an expression of um, like, not only agricultural labor, but agricultural technology. So why wouldn't there be a legacy of people working in that space? Um, but I also wanted to go back to Nicodemus for a minute because it's really important that to bring Nicodemus into this conversation. And I'm sorry I didn't bring Nicodemus in earlier, but the town of Nicodemus was incorporated as a free black town in Kansas, but most of the residents actually came from Kentucky. And oh, prior, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, almost exclusively from Kentucky. And prior uh, to taking the job at the University of Kentucky and when I was leaving Kansas and Missouri, I did, I recorded about eight oral histories that are available at the University of Kentucky Libraries Nun Center about people who were descendants from Kentucky that ended up in Kansas. So uh, a very well-known Kansas writer, Denise Lowe. Oh, I know Denise, she's great. Yeah. She's very great. Um, I believe it was either her grandfather or her great-grandfather was a Methodist minister that left Kentucky because of their stance on slavery and actually moved to Kansas, right? And then you have a number of people who um, post-emancipation moved to the incorporated town of Nicodemus. Also, there's a strong connection because all of the rope that was produced during the Civil War and after that was west of um, Kansas, west of the Mississippi was produced in Kansas. And in addition to the horse industry, horse industry, a dominant industry in Kentucky was hemp. So the people that understood that industry found a space in Kansas regardless of ethnicity. This whole conversation is just making me think so much of how I, how much I appreciated The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. There is, I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it, every sentence in that book is good. Um, there is, a, there's something that Damaris that you said about people escaping to swamps and there is a moment late in that book when um, something happens um, which is so startling and brilliant and uh, heart searing that I just want to want to mention that book in this conversation. Um, and I also want to talk, um, I suspect you might have some disagreements with this, um, but in America, um, and I'm shifting topics here, in America, am I wrong to feel like our poetry is more urban than rural? I, I think of Gwendolyn Brooks or Frank O'Hara, Lucille Clifton, who's, who's mentioned in A Bound Woman is a dangerous thing. And I wonder what, what your take is on that. Um, well, I, I want to say that again, the mechanism, the mechanism, the mechanisms of production are in urban spaces. It's really hard to be a writer in a rural space. In fact, um, anybody that knows my writing knows it's pretty queer. It's pretty, and not queer sexually. It's just weird all the time. Um, but my my agent even said to me, "You're black." you're a woman, you're experimental. Everybody in New York thinks that you're a no sell. If they knew you, they would know that's not true. But it's just the assumptions, right? About where you're placed in geography and what you're interested in that, that you there might not be a market for your work, right? So I think that Many of these writers that you spoke of, Gwendolyn Brooks, Lucille Clifton, who else did you mention? Frank O'Hara. 
Frank O'Hara. They all migrated from other places, right? Usa Clifton, born in Buffalo, New York, went to Howard in DC, then moved back to New York with her husband, upstate New York with her husband, before she began publishing, right? And then ended up living um, basically in suburban DC, but actually taught on, on Maryland's Eastern shore. That's where she spent her academic career um, at St. Mary's College. She also um, worked at UC Santa Cruz. And you know, I often um, fantasize about her, Angela Davis and Gloria Kasha Hall being in the same place at once and all of the jokes that were happening in 1984 as Reagan was entering the White House and those three women were in California taking over. But um, yeah, I think American writers have always been migratory writers. And that's just a part of the experience that we deny because it, it works well for regionalism. Even the, well. I love that term migratory writers. I'm going to use that too. I really hadn't thought of that. That's really cool. That is right. I and like I think that. your point about marketing is so well taken, right? That um, you're talking about the mechanisms of production being in urban spaces. And also you were talking before about performance, like the mechanisms, so many of the mechanisms of performance are in urban centers. I also feel like here you're saying a little bit that, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like if you have grown up in a quote unquote rural place, um, and you want to be a writer, you are more likely to have had that experience of migration or displacement, perhaps. Um, and so maybe that's part of American rural literature. In a way, it isn't automatically with, quote unquote, like urban or, or the literature of cities or the literature of writers who have grown up in cities. I mean, of course, there are exceptions to this big generalization that I'm making. And there, there's also an opportunity, I think, for a different type of nurturing if you live outside a metropolitan area. Oh, for sure. And that nurturing, um, for example, in Kentucky, people, people assume that a lot of my students may be uh, less literate because they're Afro-Latin or Appalachian. And I quickly assure them that that is not the case. Even if there's a student that doesn't like literature, classical canonical literature, the oral tradition here is so strong that nearly every student I encounter, they are great storytellers. I don't have to instruct them about the tools of imagination or the journey of a protagonist because these are, these are um, skills that have been nurtured within them probably from you know their parents or their grandparents or their aunts and uncles in in rural spaces that tell stories as a pastime you know so the nurturing is different and dare i say sometimes richer i mean you're definitely you know it's something that i've thought about my whole life living in most of my life in either, either you know writing life in either missouri or or uh, Iowa, I did live in New Jersey for a little while, but like, am, am I screwing my literary career by living here? Because, you know, it makes people don't, you don't, you don't go to the same parties. You're not involved in the same things. You don't get the same sort of perks that people who are living in New York at a publishing center do. And you, you know, you just have to find, well, you know, you find other ways. I do, we, I do this podcast instead. Now that's one thing I do to mm -hmm. say hello to people. And, um, you know, confessional time, I, I fuss sometimes at my friends in New York because they, they do have this access in social settings to other writers. And I'm like, look, like we're friends. When you're talking about their book, you better be talking about my book, you know? And so it's, and they're like, oh, well we hang out, you know, so-and-so just had a birthday. And this is across gender lines too. I want to be clear. Yeah. Since Sue, oh, you're right. like, this is sometimes when I'm talking to some of my 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 male writer friends, right? Like they're like male writers are really good at promoting each other's work, but we're I can say that I've noticed this. <laughs> we're we're not as good as promoting across genders, even though we support one another. 
And I want to be very cognizant about that. And I'm asking my friends to also be cognizant about that. Here, here. At the risk of tension. <laughs> you know? All right. So the time has come for predictions. What do you think poetry and fiction and nonfiction set in rural areas will look like in 2050? Um, this, the same thing I think America will look like in 2050. Um, this, this, this generation of people, they're really good at being aware. And what I mean, like these, these fresh adult, adults here, like these, these generations, are they Z's? Are they um, new, new millennials? I don't know what we're calling them right now. I'm officially an old person. But these people born after 2000, one of their superpowers is being aware. And I think they'll, they'll be less um, inclined to embrace the propaganda of, um, of either a dominant ethnic identity as white or as a monolithic space. I think they're altogether gonna reject that. They may even, I predict that they may even reject identity as we know it because their entire um, cultural nurturing has probably been like 70% digital. And so there's a lot of subgenre or subgenre identity identification that means a lot more to them than simply um, sex, race, class, sexual orientation and gender, right? They, it just means a lot more to them to be a gamer, right? <laughs> or, I'm a digital artist, I'm an influencer. Like those are, you know, those are the identities that they're clinging to. That's an interesting way to imagine the future. Um, but it will be far more ethnically diverse than we understand it to be now. Yeah, and I imagine also maybe, I'm curious to think about how our understandings of rural and urban um, such as they are will change with like climate migration, which is definitely in here in Minnesota, Absolutely. you know, it's that's not the future. That's that's now. People are headed to Duluth, which was on some list of good places to move. Um, yeah. And I'm actually terrified about that. And I want to say that um, the literature will reflect this evolution and in, in, in change. But I want to say one more thing about demographics. When people ask me, because I've been asked quite a bit, to uh, convince old white guys that diversity is important and that they should be anti-racist. My response is often, that's not my responsibility. They will have brown and black grandkids to do that. Conversion is not up to me. This is a capitalist society. You want to see change, invest in it. But all of that individual conversion, it's not my responsibility. But like the joke is like, demographic wise, like if you still think that whiteness is going to exist in two generations, like you're already delusional past the point of conversion, right? Because you've totally embraced this kind of ethnic exclusionary type of being in the world. So yeah, that. Um, this makes me want to have you on every, every episode. <laughs> Um, but then that's also not your Luber. So, um, but speaking of things that you have done recently, um, you are the final judge for the inaugural Maya Angelou Book Award. And the winner was just announced last night at the Writers for Readers Benefit that Wit hosts in Kansas City. And you had five amazing finalists to judge. John Murillo for Contemporary American Poetry, Kaveh Akbar for Pilgrim Bell, Natalie Diaz for Postcolonial Love Poem, Shane McRae for Sometimes I Never Suffered, and Threa Almonteser for The Wild Fox of Yemen. I'm curious what those books tell you about what American poetry, rural or urban, will look like again in 2050. First of all, they were all amazing. And that was like some of the hardest work that I have ever done, probably in my professional life. It was just so difficult to choose a winner because all of the books were exceptional for different reasons and sometimes the reasons overlap. 
So I think uh, those selections were an articulation about what the literary landscape in rural America is going to look like. Um, only one of those books was urban at best. Um, I think all of those books were juggling with um, a theme that negates I identity and um, regionalism. And it's this idea about what is, what is home and what is home to me and how those ideas of home shift or change or evolve, um, not only in terms of geography, but in, in terms of how they re reflect our personhood. Um, so I think, I think the, the final selections are a, a, a perfect indicator about what the literary landscape is going to look like in the future and how good it is. Like, ooh, if that's any indication, the pandemic has been great for literary production because <laughs> these points of reflection are, are showing up on, on everyone's pages in a real um, sense of trying to articulate what it means to be human in this time and space out there. And so because this is coming out after the announcement of the winner, and you know who the winner is because you chose it, we're, we can say congratulations to Threa Almonteser for the Wild Fox of Yemen, which did win. Congratulations. And I, and I am so happy for it, even though my face looks very, very sad because it was just that hard. I'm so glad I didn't have to do what you did. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. I owe you a lot of nice things. I, I would have given the prize to all, to all of the finalists. Like it was that hard um I love that book uh in the end I I think I chose that book be you know based based on my selfishly on some of my preferences which happens to be the intensity of the voice in, in of the speaker in that book um and the commitment to um, pushing the boundaries of what we know and experimenting with the genre. Um, I was so impressed and impressed is like an understatement with um, the book's ability to demonstrate those two skills. So, um... Speaking of great books, Damaris, before you go, we know you have a new poetry collection, Breath Better Spent, Living Black Girlhood, scheduled for release in January. I mm -hmm. wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your book and read us a poem. First, I'm terrified of the book. Um, <laughs> the, the, the book is about what we know about knowing Black girlhood, you know, what we think we know, well, what we don't always articulate. And it goes from this very intimate knowledge to kind of like this collective space and back. And so it's not really a funhouse mirror, but it's definitely has like a zoom in and zoom out type of um, intimacy with it. Um, yeah, the book opens up with a few historical poems, transitions into some semi-autobiographical poems. It ends in a space I did not anticipate. Um, the book ends addressing some of the ways that Black girlhood is uh, decimated in American culture the disappearances and some subsequent deaths of black girls in the United States. And then I found myself talking about the Chibok girls um, from the Bring Home or Bring Back Our Girls movement. Um, 
in Borno, Nigeria. And my experiences with the military did not allow me to see their experience as exempt from the comfort woman experiences of World War II. So a lot of the poems there are comparing the experiences and I think I'm questioning who are the agents of agents and actors of war and what does war look like? We think war is happening between, between men, between soldiers, but I also see these women as being somehow caught in this war and deliberately targeted because they were intelligent, right? These girls were not selected just because they were, they had female bodies that would allow them to be wives, but they were taken from a school. These women were taken from their physics exams as they were studying and preparing to go to school to be doctors. So there's, again, this other type of work happening there, right? So it is, it is the nurturing, comforting, emotional, sexual work, but also the intellectual ability of these girls that made them victims. Um, yeah, so I think that's what the book is about. Can you read a, we want to have a, a section of you reading a poem. Do you have a poem you want to read to us? Um, I am going to read a poem. Um, I'm going to read a historical poem. Um, yeah. Um, and this poem is called Beloved Weir. No. So please give me a second to find it. And this is a historical poem. Beloved Weirdo is a historical poem that, um, well, yeah, it's, it's a historical poem. So Beloved Weirdo, you are not digging this book about a slave girl and her incidents. The pages read about her early knowing of all things. Meanwhile, you ain't got a stitch of sense. If you did, you would have put that book down and hit that boy asking you if your name is beloved and if you are going to be like Setha and kill the newborn baby he wants to put in you. Is he the weirdo watching in on you and your bestie leaving the woman's clinic? You wish you would have gone wild as the wind on him for prying. Instead, you go deaf and dumb thinking on it. Your mind wanders into a book. You think on asking Ms. Harriet Jacobs, how does a girl learn to be a slave? Does a snake bite you and leak venom until you fall cripple and spasm, zombie you into a slave? If no, then you gotta swallow a butterfly and let it flutter in your throat. Smother your words until you become a slave. Do you let the butterfly kick you way up into, the, into your tonsils? This might make your eyes rummage the floor for cracks and force you to be humble. Can a slave be made from a butterfly that avoids windows, avoids, avoids the light? Does that butterfly become a bat under a girl's collar? Or do you crawl under the hoof of a horse named Andrew Jackson to become a slave? The horse galloping and neighing at your earlobes, dirt in with the blood. To be a slave, you would have to take your ribs and fashion Andrew Jackson's hooves with ivory shoes. Would the overseers use your teeth to tether, hold Andrew Jackson's shoes in like nails in the cradle of your black ringing neck, do you offer the nag a pedestal or curtsy at the mayor's master? Just curious, not dying to know. Thank you very much. Pretty intense, I'm sorry. Uh, that's great, it's fantastic. <laughs> what are you talking about? I can't wait for the book. Uh, we encourage our readers to go out and pick up A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing and pre-order. Breath Better Spent Living Black Girlhood. Thank you, Damaris. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you.